Inside this fruit is the bean that jump starts the day for billions of people around the world. Dried, roasted, ground, and immersed in boiling water, it becomes coffee. It was coffee that changed the economies of Central America. Nicaragua became what is known as a banana republic, one controlled by foreign interests, working with a small domestic elite producing a single agricultural export. Looming over the fragile Nicaraguan economy was the strong arm of the Somoza political dynasty that took power in the 1920s with the support of the United States. On December 23, 1972, a powerful earthquake shook Nicaragua and set in motion a series of tragic events. Approximately 10,000 people died and some 50,000 families were homeless as a result of the quake. The government's illegal appropriation and mismanagement of international relief shocked the international community. Indiscriminate attacks on civilians and human rights abuses by the National Guard cost Somoza his support from the business sector and drove popular support to the socialist Sandinista army. Eight years of fighting between the nationalists and the Sandinistas left 50,000 dead, 600,000 homeless, and 150,000 Nicaraguans in exile. The country was in ruins, but most Nicaraguans saw the Sandinista victory as an opportunity to create a system free of the political, social, and economic inequities of the almost universally hated Somoza regime. Nicaragua's coffee industry was devastated. Years of war, natural disasters, and neglect had taken their toll. Coffee is a demanding crop. Trees take several years before producing, and coffee production requires a greater commitment of capital, labor, and land than many other crops. Yet Nicaragua is ideally situated to produce some of the world's best coffee. The rich volcanic soil found on mountainous terrain nourishes the highest quality Arabica coffee. The Hinotega region produces 80% of the country's coffee. The town of Hinotega is called La Ciudad de las Brumas, the city of mists, for the magnificent wisps of clouds continuously feathering across the valley from the surrounding mountains. Much of the fighting during those 14 years of war took place here, and those who lived through those tumultuous years tell a story of struggle and slow progress toward reclaiming the country's place as one of the world's foremost exporters of specialty coffee. This farm had always been a cattle farm. When I was finishing college, we started working with coffee. The idea started with my dad, but he dedicated himself to cattle, and I started growing coffee. As an agronomist, I learned about the cultivation of coffee through my education, and afterwards I attended seminars to get better in producing, managing, and everything related to coffee. After the revolution, we had to go looking for food, which was rationed, but we couldn't leave the country. I was supposed to go into the military, but I didn't. Then I was forced to go and cut cotton in order to be able to finish my degree. Here at the farm, there is a cemetery for the groups of people who perished in battle. I was kidnapped and then released after my family paid a ransom. The two-story house that stood where we are was burned down along with a coffee mill we had at the time, by whom I didn't know. At that time, there were many armed groups that would wear olive green. They were called Los Rearmados, the rearmed. It was difficult to know which side they were on. There were several times that I was pressured by the people wanting to take away my land. For about two months, they took Kilimanjaro and another farm called El Tanque, and then I managed to get them to give them back to me. I showed them that the farm wasn't idle, that it was being worked and in good condition. We lost control, but we reached an agreement with the people that were there. As long as I provided them with food, they would not abuse the farm. Coffee production suffered because most of the workers were taken into the military. Francisco, our foreman, was taken into the military and they left me with nobody. I was 18 working here as a helper for three years. One day I was coming back from work with the manager when the Sandinistas were coming through and they looked at me, saw I was young, so they told me to come with them. During that time, they were the boss, so I had to get off the horse and go with them. They took me to San Rafael for training. Well, the military service is very hard work because the things they teach you are very tough. You go through a lot of hunger. They train you to kill, not for anything else. You don't sleep. You are afraid. It's scary. I decided it would be better to leave. 
I was only there maybe 12 days. I went into hiding. Once the war was over around 1993, I came back to look for Mr. Andy and he gave me another chance. But this time he made me responsible for the farm. Everybody thought that with a change of government it would get better. The Sandinistas said we were all the same that the doctor was the same as the mechanic, and things started changing, but it wasn't for the better. When the Sandinistas took power in the early 80s, coffee production in Nicaragua was still strong, but conditions quickly deteriorated. Even though international prices were high, the Sandinista government was the only buyer and paid a minimal price for the coffee. It didn't make sense to plant new trees, and there was no money to buy new machinery to maintain the farms. Students were brought in to harvest and process the coffee, but their lack of skills ended up destroying many plantations. Uh, everybody that grew coffee actually stopped working in it, you know. There were no, no fertilizers, there were no uh, gasoline, there were no means to work, you know. And uh, plus, uh, they were confiscating a lot of, a lot of the co farms, coffee farms here in Nicaragua. So people actually didn't uh, uh, invest in coffee. Internationally, we look bad in terms of the quality of the coffee from Nicaragua. So to be able to recover that faith in the quality of our coffee has been very difficult. Today, many of the coffee producers are tied to the bank with huge debt and loans from 14 to 24 percent interest. And when the prices are low, growers are paying just interest, not principal. The government's disastrous financial mismanagement and the world's hesitance to invest in a country with political instability further compounded the difficult situation already brought about by the cyclical nature of coffee prices. Until three or four years ago, Andy had about 100 acres in production. Because of the decrease in the price of coffee, now he has only 52 acres in production. He has around 120,000 trees, which normally take three years from the time they are planted until they begin producing fruit. Nicaragua has a level production of about 7,000 pounds per acre. The container used for measuring a picker's daily harvest is called a lata. A full lata holds about 30 pounds of coffee. Of that 30 pounds, the weight of the pulp is 8 to 10 pounds. During drying, the weight of the mucilage, another 10 to 12 pounds, is removed, leaving a net result of about 5 pounds of green coffee. So if Andy's harvest is 120,000 pounds of coffee fruit, he will eventually have about 20,000 pounds of green coffee to sell. Competing with the mega farms producing cheap commercial grade coffee in countries such as Brazil and Vietnam is impossible for the growers of Central America. Nor would they want to waste their fertile soil and superb growing conditions on the highly caffeinated, bitter tasting Robusta variety used for instant coffees and mass markets willing to drink inferior brews. Fortunately, the Starbucks revolution and the coffee culture created a new and expanding market for the highest quality, high altitude Arabica coffees grown in Central America. And we were starting to hear about a high altitude coffee that had more qualities than commercial coffee. And so we started uh, to, to find who were the people buying that type of coffee and what, what were the demands in how to produce it. The exporters here in Nicaragua classify the coffee inside their meals and sell the quality coffee as a quality coffee. We didn't know that. They took it and they sold it and they didn't give, it, they didn't give us one cent more for our coffee, even though it was special. We're producers, so we are the ones that have to invest. We are the ones who have to risk it. We are the ones who have to get the financing in order to, to, to grow coffee. And uh, the, 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 the middle people are the only ones that buy and sell it. And they might have more profit in doing one sale than what we do in one year. What we thought is that if we didn't get united in, a, in, a co, in, a, in an association, in a co-op, cooperative, well, we wouldn't have the, the power to, to, to negotiate our coffee um, outside Nicaragua. Now there are 650 producers organized in 15 cooperatives in 18 rural communities. In Hinotega, the Sopexca group started with 68 producers in 1999 during the worst crisis of coffee. Sopexca gained a foothold in the United States with 
Café Hermanas, the sister's coffee, grown on the farms of the co-op's 180 female growers. The demand for quality coffee has been increasing, and that is a sign that we as small producers who produce excellent quality coffee can penetrate that market, because our final goal is not only to sell coffee, but to have the consumer who buys our coffee, who buys the coffee from Sopexca, respect the quality of our coffee. Our objective isn't only the importer or roaster, it is also the consumer, who not only wants a product of high quality, but wants a coffee produced in agricultural conditions with respect for nature and for human beings. One of Sopexca's most successful growers is Floralisa Coro Montenegro. Her farm is called Finca La Estrella, the star. A few years ago, her crop won top honors at a national competition and fetched a premium of almost 500 percent of the going rate for specialty coffee. The profits enabled her to build a new home. I think it's because of the altitude and the management we give it, particularly the type of shade it has. There is quite a lot of citrus in this area, oranges, lemon, and grapefruit. We produce quite a sharp coffee. Part of the education with Sopexca is we had some tasting opportunities, so we were able to appreciate different flavors of different coffees. This farm originated from agrarian reform. These lands were abandoned after the revolution. There was a cooperative here, and my father was a member. For a time, they worked collectively, but after a while, each person grabbed their share and worked it better. I had to work with my dad in the fields to help him raise the littlest ones because my dad had 12 children and the eldest were all women. I worked hard when I was single with my dad and after that, when I got married, it was also hard because we had our first child and still had to work the farm. Floralisa's Finca Estrella and Andy's Finca Kilimanjaro represent the small family operation but large-scale corporate production is found in the vast holdings of coffee plantations such as Finca Santa Mara, with a total area of 2,300 acres of land and over 1,000 acres of coffee. Santa Mara will ship 32 million pounds of coffee to market. The farm has been in the hands of the same family for about 75 years. At the moment, we're nearing the end of the harvest, and there are about 500 workers. At the peak of the crop, when we have the most coffee to harvest, we have about 1,500 workers out in the fields. They came here in trucks or buses. We house them here, within the farm. The farm has enough space to house 2,000 people, and we gave them food and they live here with us as long as they want to be here, or as long as it takes to collect the coffee. The school is available, and it operates based on Nicaragua's school year. The cost of the schools is entirely covered by the company. We pay the teachers, we pay the learning material, the health center too. We manage the medicine which we buy at a relatively low cost and is exclusively for the use of the workers of the farm. I didn't work on this farm during the war. The owner, Mr. Julio Hermando, had other farms that were taken by the government of the 80s. They were lost, but he was able to save this farm and continued working it at half its capacity, basically to sell it at the price that the government had fixed at that time. There was no free market. The whole process starts with a small plant of coffee, which requires an immense amount of work and a lot of expenses. For us, as coffee producers, it's hard to imagine that there are people who have so much money from selling coffee that they only toasted, while we are so poor still with all the work that we do. A critical part of Nicaragua's quest to re-establish itself as a key player in the specialty coffee market is to constantly monitor the quality of its coffee and educate its growers how to cultivate and appreciate good coffee. Javier Bahia Garcia is employed by Sopexca for just that reason. My father, grandpa, even my great-grandfather were coffee producers. This is the culture of my family. When I started learning to be a coffee sampler, the people of Nicaragua were used to drinking coffee of bad quality. All of us who picked coffee knew we exported all the good quality coffee. Once I could identify healthy qualities and qualities with defects, it was something very new for me because I realized how much we would be able to help small producers. 
before they didn't have access to individual quality control because unfortunately the sampling labs existed only for the large transnational mills. The small producers sold their coffee on the black market, so the cooperatives and organizations didn't even have contact with the mills because the transnationals would buy everything in the market. We try to give the buyer the profile of the coffee that he really wants. If they want a sweet coffee or a sharp coffee with a floral aroma, we're going to find them that coffee. When there was no lab, the producers didn't really know what type of coffee they produced. They didn't know the defects in taste they were causing or the physical defects it could have. When Sopexka installed its lab here in Hinotega, a lot of the associate producers brought their samples so we could identify them and they realized for the first time how their coffees tasted, its attributes, and the productive potential. There were producers who had very bad coffee, too fermented, moldy, but once we started working on this there was a big jump in quality. After coming to the lab, they would do an evaluation and discuss each of the coffees on the table. Coffees with a citrus taste, chocolate taste, nut. Hinotega is known for having coffees of medium sharpness, medium body, and a dominant chocolate taste, and quite a floral aroma. I went to training and they showed us how to distinguish the different types of smells. The enzymatic smells, like pepper or cinnamon, sweet smells, dry smells, floral smells, caramel, chocolate, vanilla, jasmine. Then there are the smells of defects like fermentation, the smell of potato, fennel, the river. I can differentiate the origin quite well between, for example, a coffee from Guatemala, a coffee from Nicaragua, or a coffee from Ethiopia or Kenya. You compare the taste of fruits and spices, and this way you can identify everybody's coffee. Halfway between Hinotega and Nicaragua's capital, Managua, is the town of Sebaco. Here the coffee is dried naturally in the sun. This is critical for preserving bean quality. Nicaragua's largest coffee mills, or beneficios, dominate Sebaco's landscape. Our responsibility starts when we receive the wet, humid grape, as we call it. From that moment, we classify the product, where it comes from and what characteristics it has. After four to six days of patio drying, the coffee reduces its humidity to the point for storage in sacks or cellars. This is followed by six weeks of cellar resting, bringing the coffee to its optimal point for sampling in order to determine its quality and to know specifically to what market or what particular buyer best fits its characteristics. We process about 18 million pounds green coffee per year. We've seen an increase in prices through the sale of the product over the last six years due to the trust Nicaragua has been regaining 